Preston Jelvers, and I was born November the 13th, 1941. Yes, our family has been here for a few generations, and I'm a lifelong resident of Spencer County. I went to school here uh, first through the 12th grades. Then I went to an electronic school in Louisville and then went into my work away from, but I also always wanted a little bit of touch of the farms. So I have bought some land here. I live here. My brother and I bought a small farm so that our children could grow up playing with their cousins like I did. And I think it's a wonderful place to live. I went to Taylorsville School. The, there is a mound in the middle of Taylorsville. And up on that mound, they built a school. When my father went there, it was a two-story wood structure. And when he went there, there was no public transportation for the children. He was being the oldest of seven, would hook the surrey up to the horse, take his siblings, the ones that were old enough to go to school, pick up any neighbors along the way and bring them into town. At the foot of the hill where the county course annex now sits was a big livery stable. And so they would put the horses in the livery stable and then they would go up to school. At the end of the day, they would release the children who were driving to go down, harness the horses, hook up to the conveyances, and then the younger children would come down and get in and go to school. Now between the time my father went to school there and I went to school there, the old wooden two-story structure was taken down. They brought in bulldozers or some earth moving equipment, lowered the hill a little bit to make it broader on the top and put more room around and put a concrete school up there, very thick concrete building. So that's where I went the first day of my school. When I started there, in 1946, uh, the concrete building had been up for a few years. They had six grades up there. I had some excellent teachers. I'd like to tell you a little story about one of them. My first grade teacher was Mrs. Brown. Then in second, I had Miss Russell. In third, Mrs. Neal. In fourth, Miss Permelia Black. And in fifth, Miss Aline Perkins. I remember them because they were such intelligent, perceptive teachers. When I was in the first grade and had way too much energy, my teacher stepped out in the hallway to speak with another teacher. Well, one of my little companions, Eddie Holloway and I, got up, went down to her desk. She had two little American flags. We took them out, started walking around the classroom saying, salute the flag, salute the flag. Well, all the children were having a grand old time until suddenly the room became very quiet and we realized the teacher's back in the room. Well, a younger teacher might have scolded us and told us to put the flags back and that would have been a negative thing. She was way too wise to miss a teachable moment. She said, oh, Preston and Eddie, I'm so glad to see you're interested in our nation's flags. And so why don't you come up and hold them up and let's talk about them. And she proceeded to tell us a little about the American flag that a first grader could understand. And then we started learning a little bit of the repeat after me Pledge of Allegiance. But that's the kind of teachers that I had that were experienced and could just turn a negative into a positive. And so I always remember things like that. Well, I lived in the Elk Creek community until I was uh, halfway through the fifth grade. Then we moved up to the Little Mount community and I was there through my graduation. I now live in the Rivals community and so, and my grandparents had a, always had a farm out there. So I'm probably more familiar with the Normandy and that word is pronounced Normandy if you're older, Normandy if you're younger. It's a name for a Mr. Norman who was a surveyor for the U.S. government. The U.S. government had no federal taxes. Hence, they had no money. They had lots of land. And so people in the military, people working for them, were paid by giving them land grants. And he got a rather large rent grant uh, there on Normandy Road. And he built a big house, which is still there. 
In my lifetime, it was the home of Leroy and Louise Harp. Uh, someone else lives there now, but the house is still there and in good shape. And it's a nice piece of, of Spencer County history. Taylor's, uh, Spencer County is a small county, but the roads and the streams in Spencer County tend to isolate it from people coming into town. So many of the streams never had bridges. When I rode the school bus, the school bus had to go down the bank, through the creek, up the other side to come to school. That's fine if it was dry. If it wasn't dry, you, the families are responsible for getting their children to the other side of the creek. Some of my classmates stood on their father's tall tractors to get across the creek, then to get on the school bus and then come into town. One of my classmates, Vernon Dyke's daughter, Sue Dyke, who went on to become a librarian and worked at the Spencer County Library for years, uh, had to cross a swinging bridge. And as swinging bridges went, this was a rather long one. I was only on the thing one time in my life. And when I got out over the stream and looked down, I got the distinct feeling that I was moving upstream. It's the same, it's a vertigo kind of effect. I didn't like it. But when we built our house and bought the farm where we live now, that old bridge was still there. The Spencer Magnet did an article on it, showed a picture of it, put it in the paper. Unfortunately, it was too much attention. People came out on the weekends and walked across the bridge, which led to jumping up and down on the bridge, making the bridge sway. One of the cables broke, and since it was on private property, the property owner went out and cut it down. It was no longer used, and for liability reasons, he, he removed it. But it was, it was unfortunate. But it was difficult just to travel around the community because of the lack of bridges. A lot of them originally or eventually became washovers. A washover is you go out in real dry weather, you put two or three culverts in the creek, you cover it with heavy rock, then concrete, and in normal weather the water goes through the culvert and you drive across on dry land. When it rains hard, the water washes over, hence its name, sometimes leaving debris on there, which has to be cleaned off by people who want to travel. And those were what sufficed for bridges in a lot of places around here. An RECC is a rural electric co-op, and it is owned by the members who use the electricity. The history of electricity in Spencer County is that when the for-profit utilities came to Spencer County, they came out the main roads and they hooked you up if it only took a pole or two to get to your house. When my grandparents bought their farm in 1946, their private road going from Normandy back to their house was a mile. They told my grandfather, Mr. Jeffers, you would never use enough electricity to pay for the poles and the wires coming back here, but they were short-sighted because after the co-ops were founded and after the TVAs were founded, their commission was, you can cross anyone else's lines, but you must hook everyone who wants electricity. You can't pick and choose. You can't just go through to the villages and the little towns and the people who only need one or two poles. TVAs and RECCs are one of the greatest things that ever happened to this part of the nation. And it really made the urban areas bloom because farmers got electricity to chill their milk and started producing a lot more dairy. They also got electricity in their house. They didn't just put a single bulb in the living room and call it good. They wanted outside lighting. They wanted electric motors to grind feed for their livestock. They wanted pumps to pump water from whales. They wanted anything and everything that could run on electricity. Now we have lobbyists in Frankfurt and in the capital, and they are trying every day to get them to do away with the co-ops and the TVAs because they said, well, they were good in their time, but they've served their purpose and everybody has electricity, so let us take them over. Well, our electric rates are cheaper 
than a lot of the for-profit. For-profit companies can also be sold. We have companies in America now that are not owned by Americans. We have water companies here in Kentucky supplying water to some fairly large cities that are owned by French companies. I don't think that's good for America. And I think we should do everything in our power to protect our RECCs. Thrashing machine is the old time equivalent of today's modern combines. Today, when you, you may see out on the road a big self-propelled uh, piece of equipment with a head on the front that's maybe 18 feet wide, which they have to take off and, and transport separately. It goes into a field and it, and it harvests corn or soybeans or wheat or barley or oats or whatever. But it's self-propelled, it passes through the field and it does everything. Back when I was a kid, too little to help, but I had to be out there getting in the way. Grain was harvested in an entirely different way. First, you took a horse-drawn binder, which was a small piece of equipment with a sickle bar that cut about seven feet of, say, wheat. That wheat fell over onto a belt. That belt went down and made a little bundle, and then the machine tied binder twine around it. Binder twine is like baler twine, except it's smaller in diameter and less strong. It dropped these bundles or sheaths out in little groups. Then the men came along, picked them up, and set them with the grain up and the stems down into a shock. And then they bent one over, it's hard to describe, and made a cap to go on the shock. The grain was left there for a week or two to get more mature. When you harvest it with a binder, it can't be ready to thrash because it, the seed would start falling out while you were working with it. So it has to be a little bit less mature than that. Then someone would bring a thrashing machine to your farm. It was a very large piece of equipment that most farmers wouldn't own because you'd use it once a year. In our community, Mr. Jewell had a large thrasher. He would bring the thrashing machine out to the farm and they would set it. He had a large tractor that belt, that drove it with a belt and then they would start hauling all these shocks of grain on wagons up to the threshing machine. At that time, they were still using a lot of horses to bring them in. If you had a young horse that hadn't been around a threshing machine, he might dance up and down and get pretty excited. So you tried to hitch him on the offside so he had a more stable horse between he and the unit. As you can imagine, it made a lot of noise, made a lot of dust, and, and so you tried to insulate the horse from it a little bit. Mr. Jewell would stand on a platform uh, about 12 feet off the ground. They would throw the things to him from the wagon and he would feed them into the thrashing machine. The first thing is some knives came around that cut that little string, that little binder twine. Then it went through the thrasher. If you looked at the inside of the threshing machine, and I'm, I'm saying thrash and it's threshing is the proper word. It's very much like today's modern combines. You simply have uh, wickers in there that, that knock the head off the straw and then fans that blow the straw out the back and then the grain goes down and then it goes into, in, in those cases, it went down and was put in bags. Today it's stored in a large bin and then they bring a, another wagon or something, truck up beside it and offload it threshing crews that traveled around, but in our family there was enough manpower that we didn't bring in anyone extra. Mr. Jewell just came with his large threshing machine and my father and his brothers did, did all the labor that it took to, to get it in there. The straw was blown out into a, a big stack that might be 18 or 20 foot high. And then some of that straw that they wanted for bedding, for the dairy, and that sort of thing, they bailed with what was called a stationary baler. The baler didn't move. You just parked it there. It had an engine and you started it up and you just forked straw into it. And the straw was tied with baling wire. Today, most hay bales that people handle are with twine and they're not that tight. You can put your fingers under them and handle. These bales were larger, much, much highly compacted and baling wire 
was used to tie them so that when you cut that wire you had a tremendous amount of straw. Now baling wire was purchased in bundles about nine feet long. You, so you had a, about a four foot bale it went, you know, and then the ends and then a way to tie it. So I think COVID affects all of us in one way or another. In my family personally, it meant that we didn't go out to eat. Uh, I didn't go into the grocery store. When my wife did, she wore a mask, she wore gloves, all that sort of thing. There were some reports on television that there wasn't much meat on the shelf. Uh, there was never a lack of meat. There was never a lack of, you know, uh, the supply chain got interrupted sometimes because certain plants had to close down because their workers had COVID. When that happens, then it breaks the supply chain and temporarily there might be less meat in the market, but there's never been a lack of a supply of beef or any other product in, in that regard. People create uh, artificial shortages. You know, everyone can't buy all their gas on Wednesday, but if a notice goes out, there's gonna be a shortage, they line up for blocks and pump the, the tanks dry. That's just temporarily. It's just until they can get there with a the truck and fill them up, but that makes news. It's sensational, and so they report it. They do the same thing with with meat or with any other product. But but as far as affecting me for the price of my beef, no. Uh, beef is selling at a good price right now. The local people call it L as the letter L, but I guess the pioneers saw elk out there, and so they called it Elk Creek. Well, it was a more simple time than it is now, but I think it was a much more safe time. I think of some of the things we did as kids that wouldn't be allowed now. For instance, our bus driver would let us get off the bus, go in one of these little general stores, and you could buy an RC cola and a bag of peanuts, drink a little of the cola, pour the peanuts in. I don't think kids even, even do that anymore, but that was a big thing. Also, the bus would be very crowded going out. So when he got to a, like the Elk Creek Church, he'd let you jump off there and a dozen kids play in the churchyard while he went on out to the Jefferson County line and delivered those kids and then come back and pick you up and take you on out to, to your house because there was no air conditioning on the buses and it just made it better for everybody. That would simply not be allowed. You wouldn't let a dozen kids get off, but we all knew each other and everybody watched everybody. We weren't letting little kids get off. These were some of the older kids and we'd toss a football around or simply, you know, sit there in the shade and, and it just got us off the bus for 45 minutes while he made a loop and came back. Well, you know, they, would, they wouldn't let you do that kind of thing now. You didn't know everybody in the county, but you, you knew their family or where they lived, that sort of thing. We didn't have cell phones to let our parents know where we were and what we were doing, but you had to account for where you were going and when you were coming back. There was no industry. It was strictly uh, rural, agrarian. All the farms were either beef and tobacco or they were dairy and tobacco. That was the big thing. You know, and tobacco was the thing that paid for most of the land. As soon as someone wanted to buy a farm, your very first question is what's the base? The base is how much tobacco can you grow? Going way, way back to my grandfather's time, there was no regulation on how much tobacco you could grow. So if you wanted to buy one, grow one acre, fine. If you wanted to grow 15 or 20, fine. And then when you went to the market, they paid whatever they wanted to give you. One year, my grandfather took good tobacco to the market and they offered him a penny a pound. He told his sons to load it back up, we'll take it home and use it for bedding because good straw sold for more than that. So what happened is they got together, the government and the farmers and the tobacco companies got together and they said, okay, we're going to establish a base. What would happen when the price got too low is no one would grow it. Then the cigarette companies didn't have any tobacco. So this wasn't good for anybody. So they got together and they said, show us how much tobacco you sold the last six years. 
And so you said, okay, I'm selling an average of this much. They said, that's your base. That means you can grow that much. You've got barns to hang that much tobacco in, and that's going to be your base. And so they established a base. Then they said, we're going to put a base price on tobacco. We have government graders. Now, the government did not put money in this, and a lot of people misunderstood that. They regulated it because someone had to be the police officer, but the government did not put money into it. It was financed by the farmers. They set up something they called the pool. So if you took your tobacco in and they bought it at a dollar a pound, and then I was slow, maybe I broke my leg and I didn't get there for another month with mine, they said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna give you 30 cents a pound. Then the pool, which is farmer's money, would buy that tobacco. They would give me 30 cents now. They would redry it, which is the process of preparing it for long-term storage, put it in hogsheads, which look like uh, whiskey barrels on uh, uh, steroids, great big things that people can get inside and pack it down. They seal it up and they store it. Then along about July, they'd say, whoa, we need a lot more tobacco. So they would sell it and they would, whatever they paid, then they would send you a check for the difference. It was just a way of regulating production so that you didn't grow too much or you didn't grow too little. And that lasted until the end of the tobacco program, just a seven, but it, it worked really well. It was a very good regulating device. Very few people grow it. The people who do grow it, grow a lot of it. And they grow it under contract to someone like Philip Morris. And they say, okay, you grow it and we'll buy it. It's a direct thing. There is no more base. There is mo no more pool. There is no more anything. It's just whoever wants to grow it. My family doesn't smoke. Uh, we've always known it was a bad thing. You could say I'm a hypocrite because I grew a lot of it. I paid for my land with tobacco because that's the first thing I asked when I went to buy our little farm. What's the base? They said, okay, the base is four and a half acres. You, you only need a number two and a half pencil and a legal pad to say that'll make the payments. And so that's how we paid for the land. But, you know, inhaling anything into your lungs other than fresh air can't be good for you. And so, you know, I was never, we had all that tobacco there. Gosh, I could have rolled my own if I'd wanted to, but no. Uh, you know, I, I knew it was a not a good thing, and so we didn't use it. Yes, as you know, Taylorsville is a is a floodplain. It's a floodplain located between the Salt River and Bashir's Creek. Now, our forebears loved to build a town there because look down Main Street; it's perfectly level, and no other town around here has a level street like that and it has access to water. So I can see why they located the town there. But Taylorsville has always been subject to flooding. It's flooded many times. One time it flooded and it polluted all the wells. And the people in town uh, all got sick. Uh, the worst flood in Taylorsville was the 37 flood. And some of the buildings may still have lines on them showing where the 37 flood was. But in 46 and 48, 48 and 49, in 48 and 49, they decided to build a flood wall around Taylorsville. So the Corps of Engineers came and started doing that. And what I can remember as a little kid is that everything was either dirty and dusty or it was muddy. And that went on for a year from the spring of 48 so the spring of 49, they built the flood wall. It was a terrible, messy thing, but when it finished, it protected Taylorsville from being flooded. Now, the Corps of Engineers can't build recreational lakes. That's, that's illegal. So what they have to say is, we're building this lake for flood protection. That's how all the lakes in Kentucky were built. They say, the, the downstream people are getting flooded, so it's important for us to build a lake and impound this water and protect the people down, downstream. 
when everyone knows they're building them for boating and fishing and that sort of thing. The lake never really did Spencer County a lot of good. The people here never really saw a lot of it. And the sad part, and they did this all over the state and other states, is they could just condemn your land and take it. And people who had lived there six and seven generations just had to pack their things and leave, and they burned the houses and burned the barns and cut all the trees, sold the logs, and flooded it. Where my grandfather used to bank in a little town called Van Buren is 90 feet underwater, which is, you know, I feel sad for the people up there. What the lake did, though, was got a new road, 155, from Taylorsville to Louisville. And we would never have gotten that road without the lake. So indirectly, we all benefited by having a good road to quickly get into Louisville for work reasons, medical reasons, educational reasons, that sort of thing. So indirectly, the lake helped people, but the lake itself didn't do it. They didn't even build a water plant. We drank water from the Ohio River, which comes from the Louisville Water Company. It's piped out here, and then the water company makes a profit on it and sells it to me. With that big lake, if you'd put in a water filtration plant up there, you could have supplied all of Spencer County's water and sold water into Nelson and Anderson and Shelby, and it would have been a very profitable thing. But we didn't have the people who had the wherewithal to get that done. I didn't live in Spencer County. Uh, when my wife and I were first married, we lived in Jefferson County, and our youngest child had just been born. She was premature, and they had to keep her until she gained some weight before she could come home. So she was in Baptist Hospital, the old Baptist Hospital, when the tornado came through Louisville. And so I was in Bloomington, Indiana, doing some work for Indiana University. And I got, I got back in my car, turned the radio on, and they were talking about tornadoes crossing I-65, and they said, don't come into Louisville, don't drive past the interstate. It had gone over the fairgrounds, removing the roof from some of the barns, but I wanted to get home, and I just stayed on the interstate and went straight on. But it didn't, it didn't damage our area, but I, we knew some people who lost their homes. Oh, gosh. I have many fond memories of Spencer County. I, I would say getting together with extended family, uh, you know, like at my, my grandmother's birthday, Christmas Eve things, big groups like that, uh, that's, that's a very fond memory. Uh, walking my two daughters down the aisle to be married, uh, that's a very, very fond memory. Uh, you know, I, it'd be hard to pick out one, one memory. No, I did not. Uh, after high school, I went to a, uh, electronic school in Louisville. And then I took a job working for a company up in Indiana that made televisions for Sears Roebuck. They were called Silvertone. They made them during the summertime to be ready for the Christmas. So I went up there knowing it was a temporary job. They hired a lot of people and we were really cranking televisions through that plant. The people who put the televisions together were women and girls for the most part. My wife had just graduated from high school, getting ready to go to college in the fall, and she was working there at the plant. I was a troubleshooter so that when the TV was completely assembled, before it went in the chassis, we hooked it up, put it through its paces, see if everything was perfect. Sometimes they would put a capacitor in, Bronx, you know, reverse, it would explode. That was a lot of fun. We noticed that there was a pattern. Early Monday morning, a lot of mistakes were made. They came in, they're sleepy, they're talking about what they did on the weekend. There was a lot of work to do. Then it would slack off. So Tuesday through Thursday through Friday noon, really cranking out good stuff. Then from Friday noon on, a lot of mistakes. The young girls are talking about where they're going this weekend. The ladies are talking about where their husband's going to take them to dinner. Everybody's got their mind on something else, and there was a lot of mistakes. My wife was working there, 
This is back in the old days of vacuum tube televisions. Her job as the chassis came along was to take these vacuum tubes and plug them in the little hole. The ladies on the line were not allowed to have any tools. So if a little pin got bent on a tube, she couldn't straighten it. She had to put it over, call a troubleshooter. Well, here comes this new troubleshooter from Kentucky, and he comes over and straightens the pins. As the summer progressed, a lot of pins seemed to get bent over there. And then questions would get asked, are you single? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how long are you going to be here? Where are you from? You got a steady girlfriend, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things led to going out for pizza, blah, 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 blah. She went off to school. I came back to Louisville and went to work for a company. We stayed in touch, telephone, letters, that sort of thing. And eventually, that's how we got married. I'd like to say probably a little more about, we talked about my grandparents not having electricity. So when they bought that farm, when you don't have electricity, you don't, you don't have a washing machine. There was a cellar, a root cellar in the backyard. And you've seen root cellars maybe with doors that open up. You go down, you put vegetables and, and things in there and store them. My grandfather built a, a building over his root cellar. Uh, and he made it big enough that it was, you know, the root cellar sitting in the middle, but it's got a concrete floor all the way around it. And in the back, he had a little workbench where he could do things. He could store things on the side. And in the front, he had my grandmother's washing machine. It's on rollers. It's powered by a little gasoline engine. And it was kind of interesting to watch my grandmother roll that little washing machine out on the concrete apron and kick that engine over just like you start in a motorcycle. And then that little thing would sit there and go putt, 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 and she would wash her clothes, heating water in big black iron kettles. So you also don't have any refrigeration since you don't have electricity. So the ice box served as the refrigerator. So there was just so many things that electricity brought to the farm. You know, lighting in the house. No longer had to take lanterns out to the barn, which is dangerous. You know, if one gets broken, that sort of thing. But it was, you know, it was such a big thing when electricity came to rural America. Unless you lived in that area, era, you can't appreciate what electricity would do. Well, when your power goes off at home, if that's ever happened to you, how quickly it makes a fool of us. Well, the power's all salted. They, oh, no, that, that takes electricity. Their, their radio, our radio at home, was a little thing, and it's set up on the shelf away from little children's fingers. Their radio was waist high, ran on a wet sail. So you had to put the wet sail in there, hook the radio up, and then at some point, you went out to the Diamond T pickup truck and got that one out, brought it in and put it on the radio and took the one from the radio back to the truck so it would be recharged so you could watch, listen to the Grand Ole Opry or, or you know, WHAS and, and, and that sort of thing. I've still got that old radio. It doesn't work, but it's, it's, it's still in my basement. Mail delivery. Mail delivery was a whole different thing than it is now. Now the mailman comes to every house, put your mail right in your box, you walk as you drive, you get it, and that's it. Well, it was one mile from my grandparents' house out to Normandy Road. So every one of these little villages had a general store, and rivals, Mr. West, had a general store. And in his general store, within his general store, there was what served as a little mini post office. You could buy postage there. You could post letters there. You could send a picture of a package to your favorite aunt. Uh, they could ship things there to you. And there were behind his counter, there were cubby holes, and all the mail would be put up there for the... And the reason they couldn't go to every house is a lot of people lived on dirt roads, or roads that had streams that you couldn't get to if the water was up and they, they simply could not take the mail to everybody. So the people in that area had a place they could put the mail if their house wasn't right on the road. 
And if you went in there and you picked your mail up and you saw your neighbor had not picked his up and he was very near you, you could grab his mail and take it by and he'd do the same for you on a different day if he was he was picking it up. So the U.S. Post Office had to have a name for each one of these things. And Mr. West General Store wouldn't cut it. They wanted a name. So Mr. West submitted three names and two of them had already been taken. The third name that he put down was Rivals. He looked up on the shelf and Mrs. Brown says in her book, uh, he saw Rivals shotgun shells. The story we always had in our family is that he saw Rivals gunpowder. I have a feeling that the Rivals company made both, but he, he just put the word Rivals. That was not a family name. It didn't, it, it was just a name. And he put that down and that was accepted and that's how Rivals got its name. And of course, Norman, Normandy got its name from Mr. Norman, who lived there and had the large farm and unfortunately had a lot of slave labor. Uh, the tale is that when he left Kentucky, he went to Oklahoma, did a lot of surveying in the Oklahoma area, and that's how Norman, Oklahoma gets its name. I was in the first and second grade, I would say 90% had electricity. Only some people who lived way back on roads like my grandparents did. Now people want to live in places like that. There's a blacktop road that runs back there, and you know. Uh, but yeah, there were there were children who didn't have it, and you know, very few of us had running water. We had running water at our house, but it but it came from a well with a little pump that Dad put in there that that you know, so you had running water, but you didn't have city water. You know that we call that city water when. City water came to Spencer County, then everybody was saying, did you get city water on your road yet? Did you get it? And that sort of thing. But yeah, water and electricity are pretty basic things. You know, got to have those. I'm glad you asked that question. I think young people and even older people should spend some time with their grandparents. And if you're lucky enough with your great grandparents and sit down with them and ask them questions. And with the, the digital age that we live in, you can now even, you know, use your cell phone, or use your cell phone uh, you, you know, and, and have them tell you about things they did when they were kids. Have you tell, have them tell you about what was going on in their life, you know, way back. That may not sound interesting, but if you can get kids' noses out of their cell phones long enough, there's a lot going on that isn't going on, you know, on, on Facebook and those kind of things. Uh, there's questions I would like to have asked my grandfathers. I lost both my grandfathers when I was a very young child. So I never got to work with or take vacations with or do anything with either one of my grandfathers. Now, their, their wives lived to be a long time. My maternal uh, grandmother was a widow far more years than she was married. She married a man 10 years her senior, which was not uncommon in those days. If you lived out in farm area, you wanted to marry someone who had a farm, had a house, had a means of support. Today, uh, you know, two 19 year olds can get married and both get a job and, and make it. That, that wasn't true, you know, 100 years ago. You, you had to have some source of income or you wouldn't make it. But I'd say, talk to your grandparents Talk to the older aunts and uncles and write some of those things down and get them on record because someday you'll want to tell that to your children or they'll ask you about it and you don't want to say, gee, I don't know. Thank you.